OK, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Special Economy and Development Select Committee. It's Monday, the 26th of July. Welcome to members, officers and any members of the public. Um, Mark Hand is going to present this uh, paper, uh, but before doing so, perhaps, uh, Mark, if you could um, give us an indication of what you hope to get out of this meeting, um, bearing in mind that's been brought forward from September to uh, July this month. OK, so over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, afternoon members and uh, and colleagues. Um, yeah, the purpose of the report today is to have a bit of a, an end of year uh, review, really, on the work that's happened in the last uh, 12 to 15 months on the reopening towns. We're very much now in a position of moving from a COVID pandemic response to thinking about the future long term regeneration of our towns and villages. Um, and so moving into that space in terms of uh, project governance and project leadership, um, moving to the regen team um, and also uh, thinking about new funding streams and how we go forwards and engage with businesses and communities about um, ideas for those uh, those high streets. Um, so I've got a few um, slides to run through, if that's OK with you, Chair, um, yeah. and then we'll we'll use that as a, as a way of talking to the reports. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mark. OK, hopefully you're now seeing uh, a screen for a, a PowerPoint presentation. Is that working? Yeah. yeah, I can see that. And now one saying objective summer 2020. Yes. OK, great. So um, just to set the picture from the outset, um, thinking back to summer last year when we embarked on this work. Um, so the objectives around the reopening towns work, uh, which was Welsh Government um, grant funded, uh, was around making our towns uh, our high street safe for shoppers and visitors to return when the uh, lockdown rules permitted um, and therefore support our local businesses. So within that were all kinds of different rules at different times, um, some of which included outdoor trading only, essential shops only, then reopening um, and uh, and different different contexts and environments. So it's trying to make um, our town centres as adaptable and, and as open and inviting as possible. Um, to our residents uh, and visitors when they're allowed to come um, to support those businesses. So creating an environment that supported social distancing, more people friendly places, um, cafe culture um, and uh, using a, a series of grant funded opportunities um, to support businesses and just um, do some trial events really to um, try different things in our high streets. The Welsh Government funding was very much focused on um, making more people friendly places, promoting active travel, so walking and cycling, um, supporting local businesses. And um, we're encouraged to you know, be brave and try things during this period um, with a view to seeing what may have potential to be uh, become a permanent change. So we'll, we'll come to that later. Um, but I think as a collective um, you know, members and officers, we have been brave. We have tried some very different things. Um, put measures in place and uh, and then work backwards, um, amending and adjusting them as we've needed. Alongside all of this has been the amazing Shop Local campaign that our, our comms team has, uh, has led. So initially to start off, um, there was uh, a period of online engagement with our businesses and communities and we had just under 1500 responses to that and that was asking people um, how frequently they went into their local town um, or village and also how safe or otherwise they felt um, in doing so and what kind of measures uh, we could we could make. So this is all relatively high paced. Um, there were very fast changing circumstances, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, and in the report, it sets out some of the rapid changes in the timeline um, whereby we didn't have in the early days, particularly advance warnings from the Welsh Government um, that really improved actually as, as things went on and the liaison really improved. But in the very initial stages, um, we were talking through these ideas, um, holding these meetings in uh, May, early June um, last year with county councillors, town councils um, and business reps. We had a prior series of meetings at the very beginning, which was at the end of May uh, with the town council clerks. Um, but we had a notification on the Friday um, from the Welsh Government that non-essential retail will be reopening the following Monday. So everything then sort of really had to proceed with very significant pace to make sure um, we did what we could to support the businesses in reopening. 
behind the scenes, as some of you will know, we had a multidisciplinary officer team set up and we were meeting um, fortnightly and then later on monthly. So this is colleagues from all kinds of departments, primarily highways and ops, but also um, the comms team, um, colleagues from Mon Life, um, from the community support teams. Um, so who's it with Sharon Lloyd um, and uh, and James Woodcock and other support from from all kinds of different teams. So quite significant workloads on top of their existing jobs. Um, and not forgetting, of course, that at the start of March 2020, we were just recovering from the latest flood incident. So we moved straight from uh, one sort of emergency situation into the next really quite quickly. Um, so one of the things surrounding that was he introduced the measures really quite quickly um, and that results in uh, some of the feedback around engagement and consultation, which um, is, is a kind of a natural response um, to what was happening. A quick summary of some of the key measures then. So um, we did different things in different places. I think each one of the, the towns or villages looked at had different levels of, of uh, input. So in some places um, we were looking at uh, part time traffic restrictions and part time road closures, uh, one way systems or uh, um, cycle lanes, temporary footway widening to enable social distancing um, and then some measures um, to, to start addressing the towns as well. Um, so banners, uh, planters, um, very early on the barriers we had were fairly functional and not terribly pretty. Um, so they were replaced with bollards or planters or, or different forms of, of barrier. Um, and we'll talk through each turn uh, briefly in, the, in a second. Um, we have business grants available for outdoor trading, um, primarily taken up by cafes um, and a really differing um, take up in different places. So for example, Abergavenny, um, quite a number of businesses took advantage of the grants. In Monmouth, there was a much lower, uh, much lower take up, largely uh, probably a reflection of where the independents located. Um, the chain seemed far less interested in uh, in trying to take advantage of those proposals, whereas the independent businesses seemed to really grasp it. Um, also in the towns, we had all kinds of improvements to cycle infrastructure, so cycle hoops or planters, um, community uh, tire pump or bike fixing equipment, um, all kinds of uh, bits and pieces that the Paul Sullivan um, and Sue Hughes were leading on providing. Um, and as I mentioned, the uh, the shop local campaign. So there's a, a few images around the screen I'll just talk about briefly. So on the, the right hand side are the planters in Monet Street, Monmouth. Um, bottom right is um, a, a cycle provision in um, Cross Street in Abergavenny. So you can show you how many uh, bikes you can get stored in uh, one park in Bay. Um, bottom centre is a cycle contraflow on Lion Street in Abergavenny. So there's a one way vehicular traffic coming the opposite direction to the cameras looking um, and uh, a cycle lane, um, which actually uh, was well used by people on mobility aids as well, um, which was which was fine. That works well. And then the bottom left is an example. You won't be able to read the detail, but um, an example of one of the leaflets we did to try and explain in different towns um, what we were doing and why. Um, and that links to uh, some of the feedback on initial engagement and consultation. Um, and it was very much, and we accept as officers, it was very much the case that we had to leap in feet first um, and adjust things as we went. Um, that actually made it quite um, an exciting way of trying different things that we possibly wouldn't have been brave enough to try um, if we'd gone through it in a more uh, slow and traditional process. Some of the key bits of feedback, um, and this is from officer reflections and from review meetings that we've since held with um, the county councillors for each town or village, um, the town or community council and business reps. Um, the shock local campaign worked extremely well, was really well received by everybody, um, and that's something that's certainly going to continue um, in terms of, of way of supporting the businesses and different seasonal themes um, as time goes on. Engagement and communications was another key theme arising and unsurprisingly um, widespread feedback that there wasn't enough engagement at the beginning um, to explain to businesses what was being done and why. Um, completely accept that feedback um, as very fair. There was far less engagement than we would we would normally have done. It was all done in a very different way. Um, and if we'd had the benefit of um, a bit more time and resource, then we certainly could have done things uh, a lot better. Um, there's a few examples. So in Mega, for example, we'll talk about in a second. Um, 
I think some of the initial reactions and the measures would have been allayed if um, we've been able to tell businesses and residents via Councillor Taylor that um, these things were happening and why they were happening. Whereas it all happened at such pace that there wasn't time for um, Councillor Taylor to do that prep. So that's a, a really helpful bit of feedback we had um, from her and, and all entirely fair. Um, third bit of feedback really and reflection was around the success of teamwork. So where these measures worked the best, um, there was a real um, coming together of officers, county councillors, town council or, or community councils um, and the businesses. So I think an example where that worked extremely well was in Abergavenny um, and that really helped um, make some some quick and positive progress in areas where it was a bit harder to get a consensus or see a clear um, a clear way forwards or there was lots of disagreement. It was it was much harder going. Um, so again, that's that's as you would expect. But um, in many instances, the, the working relationships that were built up over time were, were really effective and really positive. So um, thanks uh, to everybody who was involved in that. And then the fourth key bit of time uh, of uh, feedback really is around time scales. So um, a lot of the things that we were looking to do, apart from the initial kind of flurry of activity, um, some of the other changes were delayed um, largely because most of the towns in the UK were doing similar things at similar times. So a very significant delay, a delay on things like getting planters. Um, we were trying to engage with local delivery companies, local suppliers and trades. Um, that was almost entirely successful, but we had really long lead in times with things like planters, parklets, uh, barriers um, and uh, and different measures. So that meant that some of those things were delayed. Uh, similarly in Tinton, uh, delays with signage and, and marking. So for example, the 20 mile an hour zone um, took, uh, and it still is taking time to bed in, but um, some of those measures weren't there up front, uh, which, which would have been the ideal. So I just take you briefly through uh, the individual towns. Um, my photo for Caldecott seems to have dropped off, unfortunately. Um, in Abergavenny, um, the key bits of work that were undertaken uh, were the part time closure of cross streets uh, by the market hall, um, parklets and planters put in place, uh, line street cycle contra flow that I mentioned and showed a picture of earlier. Um, and then some of the business grants. So the photo on the right is the bottom end of Frogmore Street, where if you haven't been there recently, it's it's really quite a vibrant street scene now um, with lots of the uh, um, eatery and drinkery establishments having taken advantage of, of outdoor seating licenses. Some of the things for us to think about going forwards are around St John's Square. Um, so again, some really successful outdoor eating areas um, for the, uh, the establishments there, but I think we need to think about how that square works in the future, ensuring it's a public square, not sort of a large um, private business space. Um, and also some suggestions for um, some kind of canopies for events behind Market Hall. Uh, one of the other things that's come up is the extent to which um, some of the, the non-food uh, businesses um, are starting to feel a bit hidden by the outdoor seating on the cafes. Um, so if there's one in a gap, um, people passing by might not see it. But I think overall um, it's had a really positive impact on uh, on sort of the, the footfall and the the character of of the town and it seems to have gone really well. Um, and again overall the uh, part time closure of Cross Street at the top end um, has worked well. One of the issues to work around there was disabled parking and again that was another key theme um, making sure that there weren't any equalities impacts um, that were that were unacceptable. Um, so that required some uh, some adjustments as we went in other places. Um, in Caldecott, um, the measures via this programme were actually far smaller scale because the town centre is already pedestrianised and there was a lot of other work going on for regeneration. So it was benefiting from the um, targeted regeneration investment funding, um, tri funding last year um, and into this year. So there's a far wider programme of works going on there with different active travel funding and regen projects, uh, but probably the main intervention there, which my lovely photo that's vanished was of, um, was of the parklets that are down the, the main street, um, really looking quite vibrant and, uh, and well used whenever we've been there as, uh, as officers. And there's a lot more to come in Caldecott, hopefully, and um, with further active travel funding and uh, levelling up funding bits submitted.
Um, in Chepstow, um, this was one of the more challenging areas, uh, due in no small part to the hill, um, so which made the town unique really in many ways. And the significant impact of that was on things like disabled parking and access. So we had to make an early adjustment um, where we'd closed High Street to traffic um, between 10 and 4. Um, loading was permitted outside of those times. Uh, we had to reopen it um, very early doors um, for people with blue badges to still pass up High Street um, so that they could get to some specific disabled bays on Bank Street um, and therefore access things like pharmacy uh, and the bank. So it was a workable solution in, in many ways, but has been problematic. Um, it does mean that the high streets um, kind of neither open nor closed. So it hasn't really fully benefited from some of the, the atmosphere that the other towns have benefited from, where it's become quite embedded um, as, a, as a people friendly place. Um, so the photo on the right there, you can see uh, there will on occasion be cars coming up there to park in the blue badge disabled parking bays. The, kind of a uh, linked part of that that hasn't quite worked is that blue badge holders report when they do drive up there to legitimately get to the parking bays and um, they're sometimes receiving abuse from other people who don't think they should be there um, and then the third aspect is that people who shouldn't be there um, are also driving through so that definitely um, in my opinion needs a different solution um, going forwards that, that really addresses those challenges um, we had put additional disabled bays in the Wall Street car park, but again, feedback from um, some of the people in the community with disabilities was that the gradient up to that car park and the distance meant that was prohibitive to them. So we're looking at ways of, of resolving that going forwards. Um, other interventions have included a raised table at Beaufort Square. So again, some of the community feedback there was people didn't feel safe with the pedestrian crossing removed. So we're putting a, a zebra crossing in in that location. Um, although what we've done fully complies with Welsh Government guidance um, in order to keep the community um, positive about the scheme and, and hearts and minds one, um, I think it's really important that they are they are comfortable with what's happening. Um, but having been there a few times and observed, it seems to be working well and with the zebra crossing will, will work perfectly. Um, as it says in the notes there, so there is mixed feedback in Chepstow, um, difference of opinions in many cases um, about how we best make this work. Um, and there are some people who think that the, the street should be reopened to vehicular traffic um, so that there isn't so much gridlock on the A48s. Um, and that, that is one option that we'll need to engage with locals and businesses on going forwards. Um, I do personally think it'd be really disappointing to return that to uh, a traffic filled streets rather than somewhere that people can enjoy. Um, but I do think something a, a little bit different from what's there now is needed um, to, to really take it the other way and fully close off that part of High Street during the, uh, the core of the day, if we can. Um, we've also just put in a uh, bid for some revenue funding for Chepstow to consider um, the sort of future vision for the town and how we pull together some of these projects jointly with the town council um, and things like their place plan. Um, how we can link in and, and really coordinate those things uh, with a view of, of seeing what the vision for Chepstow is and the recent arts festival um, seems to be one key clue in that was really, really well received, um, organised by uh, the local community um, with the town council. It's not something that we do, um, but was a, was a really great event. In Mega, um, I haven't got a photo of Mega on here to do something a bit different. I put in an example of the leaflet that was put out. Um, uh, in partnership with with Councillor Taylor um, to explain really clearly what the what the measures were. When we first went in, we closed off um, most of the square, so it's just really a road driving through. But the immediate feedback was that the businesses needed um, some dropping off space, in particular the post office. Um, contrary to that, or not contrary to that, but but the flip side of that is um, some of the businesses really. Um, uh, were helped by the uh, the trading space that was created. So Donny's Cafe is an example. Um, the nature of the business property is it's so small, it wouldn't have been possible to trade with social distancing. Um, so they're keen to point out they haven't thrived through this, but they have been able to survive um, and have given you know, that positive feedback. We've also had a, an array of, of other positive feedback um, from a survey that was done um, 
of the uh, the measures. So some quotes on there. You probably won't have time to read them all or be able to see them all that well. But a really positive feedback overall relating to the benefits to people's mental well-being, um, especially during lockdown when they could go out and even if they couldn't be close to people, they could see other human life, enjoying a coffee outside, um, enjoying the public space in the square. Um, and you know, people found that really helpful um, and has, has made the village feel um, really quite a friendly core area. So I think there's some real potential with consultation um, to look at whether uh, those changes could be made permanent. So that's something we're working on now um, with, uh, with the local community. The other thing to mention that's adversely affected Mega is um, because it's not a town at the moment, they can't benefit from any of the Welsh Government funding. So that's been quite a, uh, a challenge um, in some aspects. Um, the final thing to note on Mega is members will probably have seen in the local press in the last year um, some really positive news about Mega back in the trends with um, several local businesses and uh, the pub um, opening during the lockdown period. So we're certainly not claiming credit for that. Um, I think there's a whole combination of factors, but probably in particular more people working from home in Mega and therefore shopping locally um, during their lunch breaks or, or after work rather than shopping where they work in an office you know, in, in Bristol or Newport or Cardiff um, has really benefited Mega quite demonstrably. Um, it's brought together quite a village um, community feel, uh, which is extremely positive. So hopefully that will be, uh, be long lived. In Monmouth, uh, Monmouth benefited from several different attempts. Um, when we first began, um, we were doing works in Agricourt Square, so the road was, Mono Street was fully closed for a period. We then trialled a one-way street um, with uh, all kinds of tweaks made to the traffic lights and their, uh, their timing to try and make that work, but that became uh, unsuccessful after a period because the uh, the reverse flow on the one way system had to go through uh, the A40 trunk road and every time that snarled up, even though in reality Mono Street would snarl up at the same time because the traffic would just get through there and get chip, uh, gridlocked. Um, there's very much a perception that it was making it worse. Um, so that wasn't particularly working and the decision made was to take that out um, and a scheme was designed up that retained as much of the on street parking on Mono Street as possible, but provided two way traffic and uh, in large pavements and you can see two of those photos in there uh, where the pavements have been widened and parklets and seating um, and planters have been provided and personally I think it absolutely looks fantastic now um, it's a really vibrant looking place uh, people are enjoying the outdoor eateries and uh, ability to sit down some of these are not allocated to businesses as such so the top picture um, I think is salt and pepper. So that's their sort of trade in space. And that's one of the grant projects. The one on the right is, uh, is a general use one uh, where none of the businesses have, have got grant for that. That's just the one where you can buy a coffee or a sandwich anywhere or just have a sit down and sit in there. It isn't allocated to a business. So that mixture seems to have worked really quite well. There's still definite discussions needed on how the parking and the loading's working. Um, and again, one of the challenges has been amending the legal orders so the parking can be enforced and now uh, in the next few days we'll be doing the lining and signing work to make sure it's clear where people should be parking. We've had to allow a little bit of time for the trials to bed in um, and so now we're in a position to, to temporarily repaint the lines which will make it much clearer for everybody um, and continue this as a, as a trial measure. Um, one of the other challenges we faced in uh, in Monmouth in particular was initially the barriers I mentioned were quite unsightly. We replaced those fairly early on with a series of quite attractive bollards that screwed in, um, but unfortunately um, persons unknown discovered they screwed in and took it upon themselves to uh, keep on screwing them and throwing them in the gutter so they could park where they liked. So that was particularly unhelpful. So we then replaced them with some white water field barriers um, which were quite heavy and we thought would be hard to move and would properly mark out the areas. Um, but we had two issues of those. One was that people still found it possible to move them and it looked a right old mess, um, as well as being unclear where people should park. And the other was they tended to act as a barrier for people who had parked um, to then get onto the pavement um, for the disabled bays in particular. So the solution that's in there now as a temporary trial is a, a temporary rubber curb with tarmac backfill. You can probably just about see in the central photo 
Um, so now it really does feel like an extended pavement. Um, you're not sort of walking on the carriageway down the drop. Um, and that's really changed the feel of the place and has helped keep the parking in the, the correct places. So that's been uh, quite a positive, more recent change. Um, in Raglan, I don't have a photo um, to show, but the limited, uh, the interventions, they were really quite limited. In liaison with the businesses and the community council at the outset, they were very clear that they didn't think anything was needed. They had um, parking outside the shops, they had um, relatively wide pavements and they didn't want any changes. We temporarily trialled a widened pavement for a bus stop, um, but that was removed because that wasn't really achieving anything. Um, so the only intervention remaining in Raglan that does seem to have worked is a village wide 20 mile an hour zone. Um, so we'll be engaging with the community council to see if they want that to be made permanent. Um, and if so, that looks like a pretty easy win. And then last but not least, um, Tinton and Usk. So Tinton, um, various works were carried out to try and widen the pavements. And on the top right photo, you might just about be able to make out um, this stretch of newer tarmac where that's been made permanent. Um, so that gives a lot more space for visitors um, to pass each other and it's generally been widely received. There's been some teething issues with people before the lining was changed, saying the, the jutting out curb suddenly appeared and they were hitting it and damaging their cars. Um, presumably they weren't doing 20 in the new 20 zone um, to have managed to do that. Um, some of the areas we tried widening the pavements, but by the GP surgery, for example, that wasn't successful, so that had to be removed. Uh, as I mentioned, the 20 mile an hour zone was put in um that has been welcomed um but part of the challenge is where you come down in front of the abbey on that long straight downhill um the road isn't very conducive to people doing 20 and so adhering to the speed um, or even recognizing the speed limit was quite a challenge but now the the roundels and the improved signage and the speed indicator signs are in place so it's improving but there's a uh, still a way to go i think um, a pedestrian one-way system was put in um, for people to get to and from the Abbey and into the village, uh, but that wasn't overly successful as we've highlighted throughout and other places have found people tend not to abide by pedestrian one-way schemes. Um, and one of the challenges around that has been the plethora of signage that everyone's been facing over the last year and you, you tend to go a bit sign blind after a while. Um, so that hasn't particularly worked. Uh, the other main challenge in Tinton has been connecting um, sort of the, the village core by the Abbey um, with the remainder of the village further north up to the Y Valley Hotel, where it just hasn't been possible to widen the pavements because the carriageway's um, not wide enough and the rivers, um, the riverbanks right next to the other side. So there hasn't physically been any space to go. So that's been a, a shame and I can't see an easy, an easy solution to that. Um, but going forwards, um, we'll be looking at Tintin as part of the Y Valley Villages project um, and focusing the efforts through there because like MEGA, um, it can't benefit from any of the Welsh Government Towns funding. So we're looking at doing this one in a different way, um, unlike MEGA, which is proposed to become a town under Boundary Commission and um, Tintin's uh, destined to stay a village for the time being at least. Um, two last points then on the, on the slides. So, um, is my screen still sharing or has that ended? It's still sharing. OK, great. Um, it's down the bottom. For some reason it's, it's stopped on mine. Uh, with USK, um, temporary traffic lights were in place uh, in USK. They've been removed since. Um, the real challenge in USK is, is what we do on Bridge Street. The pavements are relatively narrow. Um, it's a main A road connecting different places. Uh, and it's been a real challenge to understand how we can make that environment better um, with a lot of the, the community and business feedback um, suggesting there wasn't a need for any changes. I think the scheme we got to worked relatively well for a time being. Um, we had the planters there eventually, which looked attractive, and we had um, the, the lights, the smart lights in place, which were measuring the queue length. However, when lockdown was really eased and traffic flows increased, in particular when schools reopened, uh, the flow of traffic just meant that smart lights um, couldn't really keep up. Uh, it was trying to keep the queue lengths either end uh, a sensible length, um, but they, they just were getting longer. We looked at different options, um, lights in different places, um, but the further you can't have the 
their light heads too far apart because of the way they, they communicate with each other. Um, and if you move them further apart, so for example, the other side of the bridge into Woodside, um, you'd end up with four or five way lights, which I mean, uh, even worse queuing. So no easy solution in that regard. Um, one of the other measures that's put in place was some outdoor trading space in Toyne Square um, for uh, for one of the pubs. Uh, a knock on of that was was some residents um, feeling like they lost their um, their parking spaces on on the streets. That was a challenge. Um, and then, uh, sorry, with the traffic lights, the other thing to mention was um, a, a frequent problem with people jumping the red lights um, when they're impatient. Uh, that caused the temporary lights to go into a safety reset, which turned everything red until they were sure there was nothing in the middle. Um, and then some people thought because everything was red, they were broken, so went through and then caused you know an even worse reset. Um, so that that really didn't help the cause. Um, what did work um, really well in OSC was uh, really of support and um, assistance from the town council. Um, so they carried out a couple of surveys. They're just doing another one now. They helped distribute letters um, and use social media to try and communicate uh, what was happening and why and try and encourage people not to jump the lights. Um, so really grateful for their support throughout. Um, interestingly, when we met, they were actually disappointed that the lights had gone, um, felt that the situation perhaps wasn't as bad as, as some of the incidents being reported. And there was a bit of scope to to keep going, but but that decision was made, and really now we'll look through the Ask Master Plan um, and see how we can address anything in the future going forwards. Um, if there is a different scheme for lights that can work, um, that'd be brilliant. But um, it, it really was quite a challenge um, trying to make that solution work. And then uh, finally, if I can just find my screen sharing part again which I seem to have lost for some reason. Um, the, the last slide is just talking through next steps. I'm not sure if you can see it or not, um, but as I mentioned at the beginning, the next steps are very much a shift from a pandemic response to longer term regeneration. Um, so thinking about, um, and we've met with Tana Community Councils about this now, um, and business reps, just to think about if any of those measures um, have worked, You know, do they have scope with tweaks or without tweaks to become permanent? Um, and if so, what community and business engagement do we need to do um, going forwards to get to that stage? Um, there's new regeneration structure with a new regen team. So we'll introduce you in a second um, to Jane and Dan, if you haven't met them already. Um, we're putting in place new uh, governance structures um, with a project board to take some of the funding streams forwards. Um, and putting in place different officer groups. Now we're moving from, from that pandemic response to uh, to um, a regeneration focus. And then the last thing to note really in the paper is um, the uh, the new funding stream. So we've just, as I mentioned, put in a grant bid for revenue funding, looking at a, a master plan uh, focused on Chepstow. Um, if there's surplus funding, we're seeking money for the same um, kind of topic for Monmouth. Um, and then in Appendix 3, we've detailed the funding submission that's been put in um, for what's called the Transforming Towns Placemaking Fund. Um, Appendix 2 sets out the various criteria that grant funding falls into. And then Appendix 3 um, is our indicative bid. So I would stress that um, this is very much indicative. Uh, as scheme deliverability um, is clarified um, and as priorities are clarified, that may well change um, with different things in different places. Um, if projects drop off the list, we have a reserve list already, but we'll be adding to that as well as time goes by. But we have a total pot of £791,000, um, which comprises 70% Welsh Government funding and 30% match funding from the Council. So some really exciting interventions that we can potentially make. And the way the Welsh Government speak in, they certainly foresee that kind of funding um, being uh, available in future years as well. So some opportunities for us to get a pipeline of projects going and think about which interventions um, we have going forwards. There's a couple of challenges in that itself, in that at the moment we still work on year by year grant funding from the Welsh Government, um, which is partly they say due to their funding from the UK Government. Um, that is a challenge for some of these bigger projects. We could really use multi-year funding security. We've had a couple of incidents recently in other funding streams like active travel, where we started projects um, and then not had year two funding. Um, and that's caused us real problems. 
uh, and in uh, a couple of cases, and then we've had to stop projects short and try and rebid, uh, which we're still going through the process of. Um, so it'd be good if we had longer term funding security and we could put in bigger and better projects spread over a few years. Uh, another challenge here is um, it has to be works implemented in this financial year or the given financial year. So where we're talking about designing up schemes, consulting on them, then implementing um, the timescales don't work because you'd never do that um, all in one financial year by the time you've you've gone through tender processes and the like uh, and uh, and proper engagement. Uh, and also there's a cap on the funding at £250,000 per project. So if you imagine a future project, for example, being Mono Street in the public realm, um, that would be many, many times more than a uh, quarter of a million pounds. Um, so so, so some various challenges to work through really, um, but uh, we're, we're doing our best working through all kinds of combined officer thinking and officer groups um, to pull together different funding streams. Um, Leveling up fund in particular could be a complete game changer if we secure those for Monmouth and Caldicott's. Um, but we're just trying to pull together all these streams and opportunities um, and really get the, uh, the best bids in possible and the best opportunities um, for this county and our communities. So overall, Chair, um, loads for us to um, to discuss and, and dwell on. I think um, overall the projects have been successful. There have been a lot of lessons learnt. Um, some were just the nature of the, the pandemic response we were doing. Others were things we could do differently if, if we're doing it again. Um, and next steps really are thinking about future regen of our towns um, and villages. Um, and in particular, you know, how we get that business and community engagement uh, right going forwards um, as we think about longer term measures and, and whether they're right for each town or village. So, so with that, Chair, I'll, I'll be quiet and uh, allow members to ask any questions or, or open up to your discussion. Great, thanks very much for, for that uh, comprehensive uh, explanation, Mark. Um, you just mentioned that uh, you were about to set up officer groups to look at various aspects of regeneration. Um, what about member input? Are you, uh, are you going to welcome member input into those officer groups or invite member input into the officer groups or not? Um, I don't think we do it via those groups, Chair, but yeah, member input's essential going forwards, as is, is town and community council input and, and the business reps. Um, so that's very much sort of an operational level um, that we found from the last year. So Jane and Dan will be carrying that forwards with the towns they're leading on. Um, but yeah, where we're consulting or engaging on projects, then uh, yeah, member input's absolutely essential. Um, through the governance board, we'll have a, a project plan that we can update members on as well in terms of progress. But that that initial input, we wouldn't do it through those very operational groups. I don't think we do it through through separate um, engagement, um, perhaps by the select committee as, as things need review in the longer term as well, if, if you wanted, Chair. Yeah. OK, thanks. Um, any hands up at the moment? Yes, no. If right, I'll ask a question then um, in, in the schedule. Um, to, to, to the report, um, you refer to the fact that we're going to be issuing grants, various grants to various organisations, groups, projects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how who who decides which project gets the money, and how do we scrutinise the expenditure of that money within the project? Okay, in terms of decisions about the grant bids. Um, it's an officer decision um, and that's in the in the constitution in terms of how those bits are, are decided as delegated to chief officer for enterprise and then and then further on to myself um, but it's done in liaison so um, the ideas in appendix three came from the review meetings where we met with community councils town councils business reps and yourselves as county councillors for each town uh, and we got the ideas of, of what would um, be potential for the future we had a multidisciplinary officer meeting and got their ideas um, about where, how the grants could be um, could be used, um, and then we've worked through it. What's really shaped the final list that's before you now? There's there's a long list behind it. Um, what's really shaped this list is around deliverability because we're now at the end of July. We have until the end of March to get the money and spend the money um, with whatever liaison and and other works needed in between. And that's really quite um, a challenging time frame. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the um, 
shaping it. That's how we've done it this year. And we could think about doing things differently uh, with future years funding if, if desired. Um, but I think the, the level of input locally worked quite well. And has certainly shaped this list. In terms of scrutiny around um, how the funding's sort of gone or, or used, um, I suggest there's probably two avenues really. One would be this select committee. If you wanted to look at the changes made, um, say in a year's time, um, and, and what's worked, what hasn't. Uh, if we need an interim meeting that will help shape next year's funding, then, then that might be wise. Uh, the second avenue would be via um, internal audit. If they wanted to check the money's been spent on the right things, etc., um, it would be via that process, so via Andrew Rotham. I think it would be interesting if this committee had a look at it. But in the meantime, um, Giles Howard's put his hand up. Giles, have you got a question? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and again, apologies for, for being late to the meeting. I'm carried away with, with work. Um, thanks to Mark and all the Highways team for the, the immense amount of, of effort you've had to put in over the last goodness knows how many months and to make the improvements in the town centres. Um, and I think we're all supportive of, of, of some of the, the, the um, initiatives you've got um, to take that forward again. The only thing I, I couldn't see, and it, it may be something I've, I've missed, is consideration about of seasonality. And why I, I mentioned that, and I could see what happened in Abergavenny, and, and again, brilliant to see the cafe culture, people spilling out into the streets, partly uh, streets rather, partly as, as a result of, of COVID and there being no other op option. But I'm one of those members who was around long enough to see what happened in Abergavenny in the early 2000s when we trialled the, the closure of, of Cross Street and it was a more or less an unmitigated disaster and it looked like there'd been a bomb scare because obviously during the winter months when it started which again was a, a mistake the street looked absolutely uh, empty and abandoned and if anything the, the absence of, of, of traffic people getting in and out and being able to park conveniently so they didn't have to walk through a rain swept town um, to the shop they wanted to go to I think it just put people off completely so Whilst everything is great now, and if we have a warm spring, good summer, Indian Indian summer, then well, I don't know if you're allowed to say that a Delta summer in in the later months. Um, what we're going to do over the the horrible months when people don't really want to spend any time out. But thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Gaza Howard. Um, that's a that's a really important consideration and something we're working through. Um, I think it's um, important. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can Sorry, hear you. the system's telling me my mic's muted, but it isn't. Oh, that's fine. I, um, I haven't muted you yet, no. Not yet. <laughs> I'll be quick. I'll be quick, Chen. Um, it, it is an important consideration. So yeah, we need to think about things like um, canopies, um, potentially outdoor heating, um, and and how that best works. So preference um, heating wise would be. Um, electric if that's possible in terms of the climate emergency that's a preferable solution but it's harder in terms of getting the cables to the outdoor seating spaces. Um, canopies look amazing at the beginning but can fairly quickly become a bit weather beaten and, and, look, and look a bit shabby so we need to think about maintenance of those um, and, uh, and who, who does that going forwards. I guess the other aspect of seasonal which isn't quite um, what Councillor Howard was asking about but it's something I forgot to mention earlier you know things like the planters staying on top of those making sure they look tidy throughout the year um, not just great in spring and summer um, and then uh, and then get neglected. Um, the town councils and community councils have been really helpful in terms of, of taking that on so when we did have the barrels in USC for example um, they're all being tied in with uh, us in bloom colours. Um, Nigel and his team did an amazing scheme getting them ready and, and planting them up. Um, um, in most instances, if not all, town councils have taken on maintenance um, in terms of watering, which is, is quite an undertaking. So we're grateful to them as well. But yeah, we need to think about all of those aspects, how we keep it looking fresh um, and working well. And yeah, canopies really for the outdoor seating. Um, I think probably if there is somewhere warm and dry, people will still use them. Um, asking around the officer group and the members we've spoken to, that's certainly been the feedback we've had. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, Councillor Maureen Powell. Thank you, Chair. Um, going back to what you said about people being included in knowing about things, at the beginning, it seemed as though you'd forgotten about the town, the county councillors were sort of just on the edge like I am. I only come down to the bus station because a lot of the things that were going on, I didn't hear from, from you folks or from that. I kept hearing it from people coming up to me in the street and I, and I sort of had to sort of pretend I knew about it. 
So please, can you make sure that when you meet up with the town councils, that you do include the local county councillors as well? And then we feel it's quite so stupid when we're asked awkward questions. But it's going very well. What I really wanted to ask was, are there, is it per, is it permanent now the, um, in Cross Street, those uh, little, um, I don't know what you call them, summer house things, are they permanent now? Because they were there just as a trial, weren't they? Or has, hasn't that been decided yet? OK, thanks, Councillor Powell. Um, firstly, I mean, apologies if you, you felt a bit on the on the back foot with some of those changes. When we were holding the meetings, we certainly intended to invite and include all of the um, the councillors for, for the town. Um, and we tried to go, go relatively wide um, as well, sort of to a, a bit of the hinterlands, sort of one ward beyond where we could. Um, so I do remember you being in some of those meetings. I think one of the challenges, though, was um, the sheer pace of change that was happening. Mm, so yeah. quite often, um, colleagues or, or Carl, who was a town lead for Abergavenny, would be having site meetings, mm, yeah. uh, had, had several meetings with, with Councillor Woodhouse and other town centre based members, um, going, walking around, identifying problems and putting them right quite quickly. So that was really helpful. But yeah, um, other was slightly out of the loop. I think because going forwards we won't have that urgency in terms of speed. Um, so that would be helpful. Fun activity. Um, in terms of the second question with the the parklets, I um, no, that's. Sorry, chair. I think we're losing you your, your connectivity a little bit. Some of the words aren't being completed. We lost you again. No? Sorry, <laughs> you're back with us. Sorry, chair. Yeah, I just turn my camera off to see if my my signal strength uh, improves. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, you're fine now. Yeah. So yeah, so going forwards, it won't be quite such a, an urgent time scale, so we can improve on engagement with with members and and stakeholders as we go. Um, in terms of the second question with the parklets, um, no decisions made on those yet. So at the moment, the temporary closure or the the part time closure of Cross Street is still a, a temporary trial. Um, and the parklets are still temporary. We think there's definitely um, merit in making that a permanent um, scheme. So uh, we'll be doing some engagement to see how that best that yeah. best works. Yeah. Potentially, Cross Street could work as as on a longer term basis now as it is without any significant interventions. Um, you know, it could work now without us doing a, a really big mm -hmm. public realm paving change yeah. which is helpful because we haven't got the money to do all of that all at once um so yeah we'll be carrying out some engagement to see um how that works going forwards but so far feedback has been been overwhelmingly positive yeah. good good yeah i i, I can okay. i concur on that because mm -hmm. uh, I, I i've not heard very many negative uh, yeah. comments about the uh, mm. about what we've done in cross street at all yeah. Before I go, I'd just like to say how well it's going down in Frogmore Street because that seemed to be left out in the past and it's really vibrant down there. Uh, and I think the whole town itself is coming together in one piece instead of being one here and one there. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Thank Councillor you. Richard Roden. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Mark, uh, officers and workers of MCC, I think that you've done a fantastic job over a long stretch now. I think that uh, hopefully we'll be moving forward as the COVID restrictions lift. I was curious as to how you analyse the requirements for each town. Is there a model for this or anything like that? Um, no, I'm not sure if there's some technical words to say it's been on the hoof, but it's, it's been a bit on the hoof. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, every town has had a different response um, and it's largely been shaped by the feedback um, from from county councillors, town councils and and businesses. Um, but then they've all got different characteristics as well. So we could do some very different things in Mono Street, um, for example, because it's so wide that we couldn't stand a hope of doing in Bridge Street in us, for example, um, which is so narrow. So it's kind of a mix of, of that input and the sort of the physical nature of the place um that's the shape what we can do could be uh, quite helpful i suppose if we knew the number of cyclists that we're likely to get in if we had some figures on car parking requirements that sort of thing so that then we could actually be objective in trying to 
uh, determine the number of uh, spaces for bicycles and uh, car parking. In, in, in my feeling, uh, is, is quite clear that things like parklets, absolutely fantastic, the widening of the pavements, generally accepted uh, by most people, uh, well, at least two thirds of the people I've spoken to. And then uh, you have the, the, the movement of people issue, which is quite significant. You have the, the parking, double parking, yellow line parking in Mono Street. I'm really pleased to hear that uh, something's going to be done about the signage and the lining for that. Uh, but in general, uh, there's a feeling in the town that there's not enough car parking spaces and no matter because of the nature of the the uh, sort of rurality of Monmouth, uh, no matter what you do, you will always have people wanting to come in from outside, outside uh, bicycle uh, range and we really do need to make provision and accept that that's the case for foreseeable future until we get some alternatives put in place if we ever do. So, so one of the things that happens in uh, Monmouth is you've got all these people parking in Mono Street. There are sometimes empty car parks behind Mono Street. If there was access uh, through the upper part of Mono Street near Lloyds Bank or something like that, then maybe that would uh, improve that aspect. And is that something that you could consider in the future? Yeah, certainly. I guess in terms of the first part of the question with some of the evidence, um, yeah, some of it's trying to put the provision for cyclists in place to encourage it rather than necessarily providing for a, a demonstrable um, number of cyclists already existing, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, so yeah, so some of that that needs some thought going forward. It's we one of the big challenges of Mono Street, and this this uh, was a was a hindrance during the during the events with the parking at the back. Um, the difficulty is getting from some of those car parks to Mono Street itself. Um, previously, people used to go through. There's there's one passageway, um, and previously people used to go through Waitrose and Marks and Spencers in particular. Um, but then with their own COVID measures, those those sort of unofficial um, access points were, were closed off, um, at least temporarily. I think MS is back open now um, to pass through. Um, so that was quite a challenge because we were getting people to go from the car parks um, down a narrow passageway where you couldn't socially distance because it wasn't physically wide enough um, to get to Mono Street. So that was a real issue in the first place. Um, longer term, we'd love to be there. Um, love there to be a, another link. There's um, a past planning consent for, is it 20? I get the numbers a bit confused, around about 20 Mono Street, um, which included that kind of passageway through. It would have been a, an amazing scheme. So that one's on our radar. You see it's on the reserve list for the funding. Um, the primary reason it's on the reserve list is the time scale for it coming forward and, and having those works done. Um, so we're, we're in contact with the owner of the building. Um, they've done some superficial works to make it less unsightly. Um, but yeah, bringing that building forward is, is really key, I think, to Mono Street's future. Um, so we just need to keep pressing for that progress, really. And yeah, having that, that link in to encourage people through uh, would be helpful. OK, so many thanks for that, Mark. And thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rogan. Um, uh, Councillor Brian Strong. <coughs> Uh, thank, thank you, Mark, for the presentation and uh, thanks to the officers and the um, workers who've done all the um, uh, alterations to Bridge Street as and when needed. They, they were there very promptly and uh, did a really good job. Um, a couple of questions, if I could. Um, one uh, of immediate concern is the bottom car park, the Maryport Street South car park, which is due to be resurfaced. I think the uh, you've been working closely with the town council who are going to pay, I think, £50,000 towards uh, the resurfacing of that car park. Could you confirm, please, that it is going to be uh, started in September? I know it's going to take three or four weeks, but uh, if you could confirm that. Um, the other one really is the old amenity site. Uh, when it was officially closed, uh, it was emptied and the relining uh, was carried out within about three or four days of its closure. So um, you, you can act very quickly at times. Uh, the, the, the town council have put together a, a set of proposal, proposals. I, I don't think that you received these initially, uh, but uh, you have, you've had sight of them now, I believe. Uh, could I urge you to 
uh, convene a meeting uh, with uh, Jane and uh, the town councillors small committee uh, to, to go through this and try and get it sorted out. Uh, I noticed that uh, the uh, transforming towns uh, uh, pot may be uh, possibly used towards something like that. Uh, you need to use it by March. Well, I, I would hope that uh, you could probably get something um, through those two committees. You could get them um, ready for uh, for implementation, uh, hopefully by uh, December, I would think, where we could have a, a market and different other things that we could uh, we could have a, a you know get get us up and running and uh, create a good atmosphere. Um, the other uh, thing, um, oh, with the uh, when, when the yellow lines are laid down by the fish and chip shop, um, the town council uh, or many councils are concerned with the speed. Uh, it's not 20 miles an hour. That uh, it's very often up to 50 or 60 miles an hour. The, the town council have um, got, I think, six volunteers uh, who would operate a speed watch. Uh, scheme along that stretch of road, and uh, again, if uh, if if I don't know whether it's organised through the uh, uh, county council, but if it is, perhaps you can put some weight behind that and uh, and, and uh, help that come into being. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks, Councillor Strong. Um, th there's a number of points there. Um, so in terms of Maryport Street South, yeah, I can confirm. Um, our, our operations team will be doing that work and they're looking to start mid-September um, once they've finished the uh, the highways refurbishment program. Um, so six weeks it'll be closed for, um, so a bit longer than I think that than you mentioned, Councillor Strong. Yeah. Um, that's happening. Um, the yellows on Castle Parades um, will be around about the same time. Um, in terms of speed in um, and speed watch, and that'll be a great idea. Um, we have got monitors down. I th I'm pretty certain we've got monitors down at the moment because we're monitoring traffic flow um, post pandemic to understand how we can inform the master plan. And, you know, we'll, we'll need to be able to model different solutions or suggestions about traffic lights or, or any other changes um, going forwards. So I'm pretty certain there's monitoring down at the moment. So we'll have that data which will show us speeds as well. Um, but Speedwatch is normally organised via GoSafe with the police, mm -hmm. um, but certainly something you know, would encourage communities to get involved in if they're concerned. Um, and not part of your question, but I know the community's been active for years on Lorry Watch um, through Bridge Street, and I think we're possibly down to just one or two volunteers at the moment. So mm -hmm. it'd be fantastic to get more volunteers for that group. Um, the data does show the difference that it's made. They possibly don't feel like they made a huge difference, but the number of lorries and the proportion that are not legitimate is is really quite low, um, so it is helping. Um, back on the other part of your question about the um, the land where the uh, household waste centre was, um, it's not one in in my portfolio, I'm afraid. It's it's with the states at the moment, um, so they're looking at um, what the future aspirations for the land might be and how the council might dispose of it or do something with it. So the um, town councils. Um, ideas, yeah, which regrettably I think they did in about February, but for some reason um, didn't get to the, the right department until quite recently. Um, so they're, they're with the states now to have a look at. Um, so I think that's probably more one for Councillor Phil Murphy than Councillor Jane Pratt as cabinet member um, to look at what happens there going forwards. Um, whether there's a short term interim solution um, that might be up for discussion, but um, yeah, no one I can help with directly going forwards, I'm afraid, Councillor. I'll pass that on to Deb though. OK, th thank you very much, Mark. I'll have a word with Phil as well and uh, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Councillor Brian Strong. Um, next question comes from uh, Councillor Louise Brown. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the uh, presentation, Mark. Um, in relation to uh, Chepstow, one of the main things um, that's said in the report, I'm pleased to see it, is uh, the need for a zebra crossing at the bottom of the town. And I just wondered how long it would be before it was uh, implemented. Thank you. I'm not actually sure on the time scales, I'm afraid, Councillor Brown. Um, I think Paul Keeble's on the call, albeit he's only just come back from annual leave, so he's probably wading through uh, his emails this morning. Um, Paul, do you know roughly how long that might take? Um, 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, we've I've got a meeting at the end of this week with the traffic engineers, and we're going to be talking about how we're going to proceed with uh, you know an alternative, if you like, to the current arrangements. So, um, but in terms of time frames, it probably will be looking at October really before we're in a position to uh, to change that arrangement down in the bottom of the town. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Councillor. Councillor Clark, yes, you're next in line. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Hello, Mark. Um, I was quite happy, actually, with the one way traffic in us, especially when it was shortened down to the lights just between the co-op and the Abergavenny Road, and it worked quite well. But the problem we had then, and we've still got it now, is when a traffic comes through the town and over the bridge to Pontypool, it's had to creep all the way through the town at 20 miles an hour. It goes over the bridge, turns right and they open up like the Monte Carlo Grand Prix. Um, Lambadic Community Council, as we've told you, have put the money aside to provide with speed cameras along that stretch of the road. Not the ones that says 30 mile an hour, but the ones that say the actual speed you're doing. And I think we perhaps need some, some police help here to have a, a speed van along there for a, a while to try and get it down. It's extremely dangerous for my residents along the uh, Pontypool Road. They come out of their houses, they cannot cross that road because of the speed of the traffic a lot, a lot of the time. And really that work is quite urgent. I know you know about it, but I'm just saying it now so I, I can keep it on your radar. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Paul. Thank yeah, you. thanks, Councillor Clark. Confirm it's on the radar. Um, I mentioned earlier about delays with things like um, planters and anything made from timber. The other delay we're having at the moment is with speed indicator signs. Um, it seems they're quite uh, in demand at the moment. So we've got an order in and we're waiting for those to come through. But, but yeah, and I agree the type of signs important because the one I know you're referring to just flashes and says 30. It doesn't matter if you're doing 300 miles an hour or three miles an hour. Um, and so That's you just right. tend to ignore it. Um, the ones that work the best, I think, are, are where they actually show your speed um, in red or green accordingly. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Mark. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that response, Mark. Um, I can't see any further hands up at the moment. Um, do you wish to sum up or shall I make some comments now? Well, I guess the... Um, only summary comments from myself, Chair, would be just to thank members um, who have been involved throughout. I know some of them have taken quite a lot of uh, uh, flack or, or, or angry phone calls from, from residents or businesses or emails at times, um, but have, have really helped. There's a number of instances where members have been out on the ground meeting businesses or talking to people and passing that feedback back to us. Uh, I think another lesson learned for us that I didn't mention earlier is um, it was quite easy to collate the uh, the unhappy feedback because it was generally on social media. Um, what we didn't do so well, and I'd do differently if I could think of a good way in the future, is collating the the more informal but positive feedback that we received because there was a lot. In mm -hmm. um, a lot of instances, members were were really helpful instigating surveys or um, you know informal or formal. Um, and there's one that. Councillor Roden was was primed to sit in a little tent on Mono Street and uh, and and ask people about, but unfortunately the pandemic lockdown changed, and then by the time it reopened, the questionnaire was out of date. So uh, they, those leaflets never saw the light of day. But yeah, huge amount of work, um, no it impacted on members as well. Um, but so a big thank you to members who were involved, um, a massive thank you to colleagues, um, some of whom were on the call, um, mm. for the lead that they took in different towns because it was. Um, a lot of work by a lot of people, so really grateful for their input. Um, I think there's some quite exciting opportunities for us to think about going forwards, yeah. um, and uh, we just need to get that engagement with communities and businesses right um, to shape shape what comes next. Yeah, thanks, Mark. In, in, in this meeting now, um, I, I've made a note of a, a statement that that you made, and that was the slow and traditional process. Um, and the way in which councils uh, reach decisions. Well, perhaps sometimes the slow traditional process needs to be usurped and um, adopt a rather more um, speedy approach. But, um, it's all to do with feedback and engagement, I suppose. Um, 
At this stage, I'd like to thank officers for adapting services in challenging times um, and uh, ask officers to build in reporting back on funding periodically to uh, scrutiny here. Um, certainly the excess uh, in certain towns has been largely due to the effective partnership working between towns and community councils and the county council. Um, so I hope everybody's going to engage in scrutiny from uh, here on in because there are exciting uh, exciting projects and times to, to come in the near future. Um, unless anybody's got any further questions or comments, um, I'll remind everybody that the next meeting is on the 16th of September and I hope to see you all there then. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Timbers. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paul. Thank Bye -bye. you for letting us come. Thank you very much, Paul.